Everybody? Man, what a joy it is to be together today. Whether you're joining us in person or whether you're coming to us online, friends, thank you for joining us. If you're online with today, do take a moment to let us know who you are and where you're worshiping from. Go ahead and take a moment in the chat stream uh, to, to hit that like button and hit that share button. Invite others to come and join you for worship this morning. And today, we continue this incredibly beautiful story of the book of Moses. And each week, you know, we've kind of hit on these facets, these three, I think, fundamental facets that are found throughout the story. That first of all, we always see again and again that God is faithful. The faithfulness of God comes clear every single week, despite man's unfaithfulness, despite our grumbling, despite our complaining, despite the struggles that we have, God is faithful faithful. And you see those struggles, right? You see the struggle. You're going to see them again today as God's people struggle with who they are and how they've been called out of darkness. And we are so grateful for the salvation that is found in Christ today, that he is our deliverer. So with you, will, if you will, go with me to Exodus chapter 19. Let's look at Exodus chapter 19, beginning at verse 5. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, On the third, on that day, they came into a place called the Wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from Rephidim, and they came into the wilderness, and they encamped in the wilderness, and there Israel encamped before, and I love this, the mountain. And Moses goes up on the mountain to meet with God. When I was a kid, I remember the longest road trip that I ever took, the place that I first learned those words, are we there yet? (laughs) It was the longest road trip I ever took as a kid. We went from Asheville, North Carolina, to LaGrange, Texas, which is about a 20, 22-hour drive. I remember because my dad literally built bunk beds in the back of our van so my sister and I could play and sleep and hopefully not bother mom and dad too much during that really long drive. Now, I can't tell you how many times I probably asked the question, but I'm sure I had many, many moments where I would look at my father or I would look at my mother, and I would ask them, are we, say it with me, church, there yet? And I'm sure you've had moments like that too, where you've been traveling. And either people, either yourself or people with you, have asked the question, are we there yet? Can you imagine being the Israelites? It didn't take three days to get to the mountain. It didn't take three weeks to get to the mountain. It took three months to get to the mountain when they left Egypt. And when they arrive on that mountain, God has a word for Moses. Let's continue on. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and you shall tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Everything that God wants to say to us always flows from hear what I've done for you. Hear what I've done for you. Now you listen to me, right? You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians, right? You were living in Egypt under the bondage of slavery for a long time. You were making bricks seven days a week, building cities to the glory of Pharaoh. You cried out to God for mercy. You asked for a deliverer from the bondage of slavery. And I sent you one, God says. I sent you a man by the name Moses who now leads you now. You lived through every one of the ten plagues. You saw the devastation. You saw the ruin of Egypt. You saw how the hand of God spared you and delivered you and rescued you time and time again. You were there under the hand of protection from Israel as death passed over you because of the lamb's blood on your door. 
You were there when a broken and defeated Pharaoh released you in the middle of the night to go and serve your God. You were there when he, you were there to go and make sacrifices on his holy mountain. And you were terrified when Pharaoh came after you. But I was there, Yahweh says. I was there. And you watched that army suffer a massive defeat as the waters came crashing down. You saw what I did, the Lord says. You were also there when I bore you up on eagles' wings. When the eagles soared through the sky, you were there. The wings providing safety and protection and cover. God gave them a song to sing by the sea. God gave them food when they were hungry. God gave them water when they were thirsty. God gave them victory when they were in battle. And God gave them wisdom as we saw last week when they needed it the most. Because we know you can never do this alone. And that brings us to the moment. Are we there yet? We are. Finally, the moment of eager expectation. We have made it to the mountain. Let's go to verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. All the earth is mine. Verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. In these two verses, we see exactly what God's desire is for his people. It's kind of like when you start school and a teacher hands out an overview guide for the class. And here says, this is what I expect from you. These are what is uh, the assignments for the class. This is what we're going to do in my class together. Or when you go to orientation for a new job and you have to sit through the guidelines of employment, you have to read the policies and procedures, you learn what's expected of you in your new work environment, God is making himself very clear here. Let's break it down, church, because I'm going to let you in a little secret. What God says to the people here in Egypt is the same thing he says to us. Living in 2023 in, 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 in Alabama. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, but a slight modification, if you will, and I'll get that later. God is making himself clear. So notice how he begins. He says, now therefore, which means in light of everything I've already done, right? Now therefore, if, oh, I love that word if in the Bible. If, and we have this classic then, right? If you do this, God says, then I will do that. If, then. Never ignore the if-thens in the Bible. It's kind of like your parents, right? If you clean your room, then we'll go get ice cream, right? If you get good grades, then you can earn a reward. If you're well-behaved, then we'll do something fun afterwards. This is one of those if-then moments with the Lord, right? So what's the if, church? It's two things. If you will indeed obey my voice, he begins, right? That just simply means God speaks, we listen. God tells us to do something, we do it, right? He acts, we follow. If you'll indeed obey my voice, and if you will indeed keep, and I apologize, that should be my covenant. If you'll indeed keep my covenant, right, which is really chapters 20 through 23, you want to know what the covenant is? All you got to do is read chapters 20 through 23 in the book of Exodus. And out back is a guide that will walk you through that. It's on the table out there. But if you read that, that's the covenant with all of its stipulations, all of its laws, everything, right? And God says, if you just obey my voice and if you will indeed keep my covenant, God says. The Lord is straightforward. Listen to whatever I say. Keep my covenants and statutes. Keep my covenant, right? What does all that mean? It means worship God alone. Don't build four idols. It's the Ten Commandments, y'all. It's just keeping the Ten Commandments. 
I mean, think about those two tablets, right, that are standing before us of the Ten Commandments that Moses is holding, right? Don't have any other gods. Don't worship idols. Honor my name. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Honor those in authority, just like we read a minute ago, especially mom and dad. Don't kill anyone. Don't sleep with anyone who's not your husband or your wife. Don't take things that don't belong to you. Don't talk bad about people. And especially learn contentment. Don't covet what God has not already brought into your life. That's it. That's it. Right? And if you do that, if you do all of that, and a little bit more, look what happens. Three things will happen in your life. Number one, you will be my treasured possession, God says. You will be the treasure of my life. He says, you will be my kingdom of priests, and you will be my holy nation. What does that mean, right? What does each one of those phrases mean? Well, let me give you in a simple way. See, to be my treasured possession means you are blessed by God. Every blessing that you ever have in your life comes from God alone. He is the giver of all good things. To be a kingdom of priests means you now have access to God. You don't have to go through somebody to get to God. You have a relationship with God. He is there to listen to you. He is there to be with you. He is present in your life. He is a part of your world, and he is the leader of you, right? To be a holy nation means you are unique because of God. You are set apart. You are different. You are made in the holy image of God. You are redeemed and covered by Jesus, right? These three things, my treasure possession, my kingdom of priests, and my holy nation, right? And see, what's so incredible about our God is that what he desired for Israel way back in 1500 B.C., as the people came out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt, is no different than what he desires today for you and for me right now in this place. God's motivation and God's desire and God's plan for his people has never changed. In fact, let's pull out again our wonderful Exodus theological concept that I introduced a couple weeks ago. Maybe you remember it. Peanut butter and jam. When you find the peanut butter in the Old Testament, go looking in the New Testament for the jam to see when the two come together. Here we've got a beautiful example of peanut butter and jam. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, listen to what the word of the Lord says. As you come to him, now who's the him, church? Jesus, yeah, let's say the Sunday school answer on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus. As you come to him who is Jesus, who is a living stone who is rejected by men, but who in the sight of God is chosen and precious, right? What are you? What am I? What are we? We are a chosen race. We are are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people of his own possession. That's who we are. You shall be three things, God says. My treasured possession, check. My kingdom of priests, check. My holy nation, check. You gotta love Peter peanut butter and jam theology. God's desire for his people has never changed, church. So what's the issue though? What's the issue between the old covenant and the new covenant? What has changed between the two that Jesus introduces? Well, it goes back to the word if. It's always about this word if, right? In Exodus it says, if you will indeed obey my voice, and if you indeed will keep my commandments and my covenant. And it doesn't take long to see that if is the problem, right? Think about this. We are terrible at keeping the if, amen? Come on, just think about this. We are terrible at keeping the if. 
We are terrible about obeying his voice. We are terrible about keeping his covenant. Think about this. Let me just ask you a series of questions, and you will see how terrible we are at this. Number one, how often do you build your own idols, and you worship people, places, and things, and you put your hope and your trust and confidence in something other than Jesus? How often do you misuse God's name? You don't call upon him when you're in trouble. You don't ask him for help when things are not good. You don't go to him daily in prayer, constantly in prayer. You don't give thanks for everything. You don't recognize the blessings and honor him for it. You don't praise his name and song daily. How often do we fail to honor the Lord's day and keep it holy? As we jam-pack our lives filled with other things. How often do we disrespect those in authority, especially our parents? How often do we allow lust to build up inside of us so that we've committed adultery in our hearts? How often do we take uh, anger and let anger get the best of us, causing us to lash out and be vengeful and seek revenge and cause murder in our hearts? How often do we take things that don't belong to us or, or worse, fail to protect those who are weak and those who are innocent and those who are being taken advantage of and those who are abused? How often do we talk bad about people? How often do we not put the best construction on everything? How often do we look at people and say things and do things that are hurtful? How often do we live without being content but rather covet and desire more. We're terrible at keeping the covenant. I am, you are, the whole world is. But if it's God's desire, right, and it is, that we should be his treasured possession, his kingdom of priests, his holy nation, then what do we do about the if, church? If we can't perfectly obey his voice, if we can't perfectly keep his commandments, then what can we do? Well, let's go back to what Peter says in chapter 1, verse 18. And I'm going to pick up in the middle of the verse to make it clear. 1 Peter 1.18. You were ransomed from the futile ways that you inherited from your parents and your grandparents and your entire, geon- the entire family line. You were redeemed. No matter how much you and I desire to obey God's voice, and no matter how much we want to keep his commandments, our sinful flesh will make our efforts futile. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad things that I would rather not do, that's what I keep on doing. So what am I going to do? That's when God steps in and he pays the ransom price for our lives. Just as God stepped in to the life of Egypt to redeem them out of the bondage of slavery from Pharaoh, God steps into our lives and ransoms us out of the bondage of sin and death and the devil. God is going into history once more to redeem his people, this time through the blood of Christ. Here's how Peter describes it. How does he do this? Not with perishable things. He says there, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Your faith and hope are in God. So watch how things have changed, church. In the old covenant, there was if and then. If you listened, if you obeyed, if you kept my commandments, if you kept the covenant, then, what does God say? Then you'll be my treasure possession. Then you'll be my holy people. Then you will, you, you will do these things, right? Then. 
But watch the change. In the new covenant, Jesus has taken the place of if you. So instead, we see that Jesus is the one who listens to the voice of the Father. Jesus is the one who keeps the covenant faithfully on our behalf. Jesus is the one who then enacts a new covenant for his people. And since Jesus not only keeps the old covenant, but he enacts a new covenant, right? A covenant established by his precious blood, a covenant made whole, made by the spilling of his life on the cross for me and for you, a covenant celebrated when we come and we take and eat the body of Christ and we take and drink the blood of Christ, a covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Then, you and I are because of Jesus. What are we? We are a chosen race, a holy people, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possessions with a purpose that you and I can now proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Walk away today with a simple truth. You are a treasured possession. We are kingdom of priests. We are holy nation. And we can live our lives freely now to do what? Listen to the voice of Jesus. We can obey the voice of Jesus. We can keep the commands of Jesus. Will we do it perfectly, church? Say it with me. No. Will we do it perfectly? No. Only Jesus can do that. Therefore, we will be imperfect people following a perfect Savior. We will be imperfect people following a perfect Savior who has made us a treasured possession. You and I belong to Jesus. He made us a royal priesthood. You and I have unlimited access to God whenever we need it. And when we go to God, what do we find? mercy and grace. And you and I are a holy nation. The one thing that the church has lost that it must learn to regain is how to live as holy people. Our lives should look different than the world. The way we think should be different than the world. The way we speak, the way we love, the way we forgive, the way we show compassion, the way we extend grace, the way we dish out mercy, the way we serve, the way we praise, the way we give, should look, feel, sound different than the world. That is when we live as holy people. This is who we are. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all said together, amen. Let's stand, church.